no worries. So I'll start the recording now. And uh, Christian, you can uh, take over from here. Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, <laughs> everyone. So my name is Christian. I work as a bioimage analyst at EMBL Heidelberg. And today it's my great pleasure to announce my dear colleague, Anna. <laughs> who, first of all, it's a lot of fun working with her, and it's great to have her as a colleague. So, um, so Anna studied mathematics, and she received a diploma at Moscow State University. And then she worked, in fact, as a scientific programmer in CERN, so pretty serious stuff. <laughs> then in 2008, she switched to image analysis um, in Heidelberg in the lab of Fred Hamprecht, that some of you may know. And um, I think she became, among other things, famous for leading the development of the well-known Elastic software, which she is actually still doing. Um, and then, in fact, even during the time with Fred Hamprecht, uh, she worked as a postdoc and had already a collaboration with Janilia. And um, so maybe some of you know her still from that time. Um, and then since 2018, we were lucky to recruit Anna to EMBL Heidelberg, where she is now a research group leader and works on machine learning based methods for uh, the analysis of biological images. And that's what she will talk about today and looking forward to your talk, Anna. Thank you very much, Christian, for this very kind introduction. Let me try to share the screen again and see if that works this second time around too. You see that? Is it there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. So, yeah, I want to tell you about the project that I've been involved in and like, you know, parts of my group have been involved in since I started at Emble in July 2018. Right, and this is about a um, segmentation problem in the whole organism level. And uh, well, our quest to find all the cells in a Platinaris glomeruli marine worm. So in particular, I want to take you through all the steps of yeah, making an atlas of this animal. And which for now, what we have done is the cell segmentation and the gene expression assignment. We are now working on the cell type classification. And then finally, I'll tell you a little bit about the Mobi browser, which Christian is actually building, but it's a necessary component here. So although Christian is not in my group, I have to talk about this part too, because it would be missing a major part if I missed that. So yeah, it's a very big collaborative project and uh, involves a lot of people across many labs. Uh, there are some from mine, some from the EM facility. It's all driven by the biological vision of Detlef Arendt, who is in the developmental biology unit at Emble. And yeah, and that is our central data set, uh, which is the one I mostly will be talking about. So this is, a, like I said, a marine worm called Platinaris glomeruli at six days post-fertilization. And uh, it's big enough to be interesting, but still small enough so that you can actually take the whole organism EM data set. So that has been imaged by SBFSEM in um, the FMI at Basel. And uh, at the resolution of 10 by 10 by 20 nanometers, it's in total an eight terabyte data set. One and a half terabyte of it is actually animal, but it's kind of lying diagonally. So you have to yeah, mask it out. All right, so it's a very pretty data set. So you can see from afar that it looks like the cells are well separated. You can also look in much closer and you see that detail is very well preserved. I'm not actually sure what these two insets are showing. I just look at them aesthetically and it looks like there are a lot of very nice things that you can clearly discern in there. Now, as a disclaimer for the rest of the talk, while many, well, everything else basically is really, really well preserved, there have been some problems with the neuropil, and the neuropil in particular is actually not traceable. So when I will talk about cell segmentation and about you know, classifying cells by their morphology and so on, for neurons, we are always talking about the cell somata. We don't actually have all the you know, axons and dendrites traced. It's only the, the soma part. Okay, with that in mind, let's go to the segmentation part. Right, so segmentation in my group is carried out by Konstantin Pape, who, was, um, yeah, who joined EMBL together with me and actually came back from Genelia to do that. And there he brought all the knowledge about running segmentation at very large scale and applied it to this project. And so here we started from the baseline that we have used for the connectomics data that I've been working on in my postdoc also together with Konstantin. And so this is the standard segmentation pipeline, right? So the baseline that most people use, except Google. Right? And the 
the way that works is that you start from the raw data, you predict where the boundaries are, so the cell boundaries, right? Then you, because the cell boundary prediction is never really perfect, perfect, you break it up into super pixels, and then out of the super pixels, you build up the complete neurons from some kind of a graph-based agglomeration, right? So this image is from the paper from 2017. All these steps have been improved since then, right? The networks got better, the super pixels got better. There are more variants in the graph-based agglomeration, but still the essence of the baseline is like this. So we started from that and we actually yeah, applied this and you can see the results here. So the boundary prediction, yeah, that's what it would look like for a piece of a platinaris, right? So then you can make that into super pixels and you see that you see some blocking artifacts. They come from the fact that it's just such a big volume, right? That you have to process everything in blocks, but we actually have the software for this. So the blocks will be gone, right? And after that, if you apply graph agglomeration to that step, you will get a segmentation which looks like this. So that is already not looking too bad, right? And this is something that I've already been showing because, well, if you don't squint too much, that actually looks like a decent segmentation. And also especially note that this neural pill is one big object here, like I said, right? but everything else actually looks like they're nicely separated. The problem is if you look in more detail, it's good, but it's, we want it better. Right? In particular, what we see is that it works very well in the areas which have good quality, and which are similar to the training data. So if we look at the examples of where it actually fails, right, so you see here, there is a piece of a missing membrane, right? Who knows where it went? Could be a sample prep problem. Could be like, I don't know if you can actually see my cursor, like in here. No. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look we, at, can we can see, see it, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So if you look here, there was probably a membrane or maybe not, maybe it's actually going like this and this is just some inner stuff floating in there, who knows? Right. Also over here, I'm not sure if that should be separated or not. So they're just places in the area which are just difficult, right? And they're difficult for humans and they would also be difficult for an algorithm. If you don't have a boundary, it's hard to predict a boundary. Well, the other, and that's the kind of a problem that we were already used to from the connectomics days, because there are also, of course, if you go large enough, the data preservation will never be perfect. But now we found a new problem that we had not seen when we were analyzing the brain images. And this is the problem of much greater heterogeneity of the data as compared to when you're just looking at the brain or when you're looking at the whole organism. So here, most of the training data that we used for the boundary prediction neural network actually was in the animal head. And then you apply it here and you see that, for example, this boundary here, it's an excellent boundary. So as a human, you have no problem with it, right? But it's a boundary from, I don't know what, I guess, neural tissue to muscle, which we did not have in the training. Right? And this one is the boundary between two muscles. And sometimes you have other tissue boundaries. And then if the network that is predicting the boundaries has not seen that in training, it will not detect them. Right? It just ignores them as you know, strange local variability, who knows what. Right? There is a lot of stuff that happens in the end data. So these were the two problems that we have seen and that we wanted to, yeah, to fight with. The problem was that, well, there is an easy answer to this. You can just take more training data. Now, this is, of course, not something that anyone wants to do, because I'm sure many of you can relate to that. Making 3D segmentation training data, especially for EM data, is really difficult, right? It's either very expensive if you have to outsource it, or you have to spend months sitting there and like painting little cells in 3D. So we really, we spent enough time doing the original volume, so we really didn't want to make more training data, so we tried to actually make the segmentation more consistent with what we know is true by other means. And that's what I want to tell you about. All right, so here, let's go back to the baseline. All right, so remember the three steps, boundary prediction, then super pixels, then you have the final agglomeration. All right, and on top of that, we now want to put in some kind of a top-down prior or biological knowledge that of things that we know are happening in this data, which the network that is only going bottom up cannot really see. Right, so if we, in more detail, like imagine that we go on this middle step, right, we already have the boundaries predicted, and now we have the super pixels. So imagine that you have this super pixel image, and then you know that forms some kind of an oracle of biological knowledge, that these two positions must be separated, right? That in the final segmentation, these two pixels should not be together. What you can do in this case is, well, remember that we are actually building a graph out of this network predicted super pixels, right? So you have like all these boundaries in here, right? And you have out of that, you build a graph, 
where everything that is adjacent is actually connected by an edge. So what we can do on top is we can introduce another edge, which can be very repulsive also for the areas which are not directly adjacent. Right? So if we know that two points must be disconnected, we can really push them apart in this final agglomeration procedure. Right? So yeah, if you look back on the boundary prediction here, if we yeah, take a look at the example of our Platy data again, so you can really see where it's missing, right? So you see like there is this unclosed boundary to the muscle just because it has never seen anything like this. Then there are areas like that where it's just completely lost. You know, it's like, what is even happening there? It has never seen anything like this. And then there are areas where it actually works quite well. So what kind of a prior information can we put in there? If we have those super pixels, right? So what could we say must be separated? And remember that, of course, we don't want to just sit there and work as a sort of a biological oracle there and provide this pixel by pixel repulsive information for one and a half terabytes of data. So it has to be some kind of automatically foundable prior. So what we started from, or like what was the easiest thing to do was to go from the nuclei. So the nuclei in this data are very clear. They are very easy to segment, right? Even from little training data, there is surprisingly little variability in them. So the nuclei you can do very easily. They also don't touch. So you don't have a problem of everything merging together. And yeah, so we can do the nuclei and then we can remember that a cell should only have one nucleus, right? And I know multinucleated cells exist, right? This is not the level of the problem that we are tackling here, right? So if we get to the multinucleated cells, I would say we are in a good state. So we have the nuclei. Now we can say, okay, let's look at a particular nucleus like this one here. Right? Out of this one, we can now say, well, all those other nuclei, push them apart, right? We don't want to merge with them. If a certain superpixel be belongs to a different nucleus, then it for sure should be separated from the other one. Similarly, we can then say that if they belong to the same nucleus, they should actually be together, right? So this kind of edges, you can make both repulsive and attractive. Okay, so we can build repulsive and attractive edges. Right? We can, at least some of our biological knowledge, we can translate it to edges like this. What do you do with this? So this whole framework of solving segmentation problems as graph agglomeration that has been pioneered by Bjorn Anders and Fred Humphreys group. And then when he became the PI um, independently, he's still working on this as a theoretical problem in discrete optimization. Right? And they've formulated it as a multicad problem and then as a lifted multicad problem. So what we have done is solve it for a small use case that we actually have here where you don't only have adjacent cells together that you're considering, Right? It's not that you have the cells that are a certain distance apart, but you really have a specific number of very sparse connections that can, on the other hand, go quite long distance. Right? So this is this sparse lifted multicut that we have introduced for this. And then this is a, yeah, so this is an anti-hard problem, but there are good solvers for it. And uh, Constantine also found a way of how to actually do it blockwise. Yeah, so that's what we do. We now know how to, if you have the edges, right, we know how to take them into account and do the segmentation. What else could we do other than nuclei? So for us, an easy thing to add was tissues because you, know, you see that in this tissue boundaries, which like I said, are not really recognized because in the head we don't have them, which was where the training data was. And you see, we had some really horrible errors like this where you know, if you're missing a boundary and then it leaks out and then it's just like all over the place. So what we wanted to do is to detect this tissue boundary separately and just add them on top. Right? So how would we detect the tissue boundaries? So here you can just take Elastic and take a version of the data set, which is uh, downscaled many times. And then the tissues are actually quite characteristic. So you can see that, for example, the epithelial cells, right? They're very different. I guess it can also just recognize this background with this uh, stuff embedded for better imaging. Right? But also the other things, right? Like this lipids and the, um, yeah, other things. So you can, the tissues can be found quite well. And then if you put in this repulsive parts that would tell you that you should never have a cell that goes across tissue boundary, it actually gets much better, right? So you can, uh, yeah, you see like this, this horrible segmentation there actually turns into a very nice gland. And with all of this together, yeah. Wait, am I going the wrong way? Sorry. You can actually come to a pretty nice segmentation of the whole organism, right? And here you can see both the nuclei and the cells. And then we can also look in a bit more detail, right? So if you want to look quantitatively, we have even done some metrics here. 
and uh, we had experts. Of course, we didn't want to ping the complete outline, but we just wanted to see about the number of false splits and false merges there. So we now know that the animal at this stage has about 12,000 cells, 11,500 cells. So we have put, uh, we have eight wonderful experts who have done this, who have put a dot in every in nucleus out of around 3,000 nuclei, every cell in 4,500 cells. And then, yeah, we just wanted to check how well it's doing. So we can see that for the nuclei, it's really doing very well. Right? It's, uh, yeah, 0 0.5 false negative, 0 0.5 false positive. Like cells are not so easy, but it's actually not too bad. Right? And you can see the examples here that I have put in. Right? So this is, for example, a very characteristic false split when you have an already dark cell and then there's some kind of an inner thing floating in there and then it just gets cut. It happens sometimes. Right? Yeah. And sometimes you also have, this would be a false merge. Right, so in between here, there is a real cell boundary. Right, so I can't see it and the algorithm also couldn't see it, but it's there. Right, so the humans that were looking at high magnification, they could see it. So it's really not too bad. So the cell segmentation, you can also look in more detail. You see that the muscles are very neatly segmented here and you can see them really going through the whole animal all the way. Right, you can look at some more sophisticated cells like the nephridia, which have cilia, and you can have the cilia going through all the cells stacked on top of each other. So the segmentation is there. What's next? Then we are going into the question of the gene expression assignment. And this is what Valentina in my lab is doing. And here, well, the data set I just told you about is all EM, but that's not the only thing that we have to build the atlas of the platinaries. The other thing is the gene expression atlas. And um, the reason why we can even bring it all together is that platinaries is a very nice animal, which is very stereotypic even at this kind of a late stage where all cells are already differentiated, it's still very, very stereotypic. So we can actually combine different individuals which were imaged separately to create something that would make sense for all of them. So here there is a gene expression atlas that was started already in 2017 and already published separately, but now there are a lot more genes in there and the genes are done by the whole mound fish um, at very good resolution. It's 201, I think even maybe a little bit more genes now. And yeah, that's what it looks like, right? So you have every gene like this, and then yeah, that's the kind of just a pretty picture of the overall thing. So what we want to do with this is we want to take all these segmented cells that we have, right? So all the ones here, and then take all these gene expression profiles, and then just basically create a matrix that would tell you if a certain gene is expressed in a certain cell. How can you go around this? So the most direct approach is just go by overlap. So like I said, the animal is very stereotypic. You can basically just put the images on top of each other and see what is expressed where. Right? So Christian has actually done the alignment of the light and EM volumes, and the alignment is very good. So it's say plus minus half a cell, because you, know, you can't expect an alignment that would be completely perfect because the resolution difference is very large. And also they are still different animals and it's 11 and a half thousand cells. So you can't expect that they would perfectly match pixel to pixel, but it's good, right? It's good. So we could say, let's just go by overlap and count if the gene is expressed, if its, uh, if it's expression area overlaps with more than 50% of a segmented cell volume. Unfortunately, like I said, it is kind of plus minus half a cell. So we have these genes which are sort of leaking out, right? So here you can see a gene, I don't remember which one, but something that is expressed in the neuropil. And you can really see how it kind of leaks to all the sides. Right? So it's, it, it should be contained in here, but it leaks over and then that can create this expression profiles, which are not really true, which are just taking it over from the neighboring cells. So what we have done instead is the following. So you can define the so-called virtual cells. And this is something that Hernando has already done with the light microscopy atlas. And then we have extended this for the combined thing. Right? So the virtual cells are like the spatially coherent expression clusters. So you have these 205 images, which show 205 different genes, right? And then you try to, out of these 205 different channels, you try to build like minimal units where you have homogeneous gene expression, right? So they're not necessarily single cells. So this could still be, let's say pairs of cells or little clusters of cells, but they are little clusters of cells which always come together, right? So we in total have around 5,000 of these virtual cells, which is probably not enough, right? So some of them are actually little clusters. But still, we have this minimal units of homogeneous gene expression. And then we decided, OK, so instead of assigning every gene independently, we would rather first build the 
possible profiles, right, which we can then get from these virtual cells, and then assign the complete profiles. Right? So yeah, that's the whole idea that we would assign the each segmented cell to this kind of a virtual cell to the spatially coherent expression cluster. OK, how is that done? Uh, here you can see an example where I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So yeah, just to mention that these animals, they are great in so many ways. So they are not only small enough to fit into the EM and all differentiated with 11,500 cells and stereotypic, they also have bilateral symmetry, which means that even for things that you don't know what they should be, you can at least expect that they should be the same on the two bilaterally symmetric sides. Right, so here, what we can then see is if we look at the two cells, which um, just from morphology and their position and what is around them look like this is the same type, right? This is essentially, these are the bilaterally symmetric cells. They should have the same expression profile. So if you look at the expression of two genes, in this case, patched and MSX, I never really know how the gene names are pronounced, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, you can see that if you only go by overlap, then the green M6 gene would be found in the left cell, right? And the blue patched gene would be found in the other side on the cell two, right? But this, they would not be consistent. So if you instead go by this kind of a stable areas, then you can see we have three virtual cells here, right? So we have the VC3, which is a bit far, right, VC2 on this side, and then here is this VC1. And then we say, okay, if we assign, we assign to the whole list, right? We don't say we take this gene, but we don't take that gene. If we assign, we assign the complete profile. And then out of the ones that are sort of within reach for these cells from the Euclidean distance perspective, we then take the one that from the gene expression distance matches the best. And now we know that they would all match. Okay, hope that's clear. So another word about the bilateral symmetry, uh, like I already mentioned, we use that to validate this gene expression assignment because, well, it's impossible to say what genes should be expressed in a given cell. Right? So even the most advanced platinaris biologists in that lives group cannot tell that for every cell and every gene. So we don't really have ground truth for this, but we can exploit this idea of bilateral symmetry. So we can find these pairs of cells on the two sides of the animal and then say, well, we don't know what they should be expressing, but it should definitely be the same thing. And this is the measure that we actually use to evaluate how good the expression is, right? So we measure the mean discrepancy between the right and the left side. So we have made for that, we have, um, I mean, they are stereotypic, but it's not exactly so stereotypic that you could just cut a line and say, now it's a mirror image. Right? You still have to find those cells that are the, that form the bilateral pairs. So Valentina, together with Rachel from Yannick's lab, actually went over the whole volume and found 208 of these cell pairs that we know should match. Right? So with all the disclaimers that these are really the ones where we can tell they should match. So these are probably the ones that have a special morphology and they're different from their neighbors. So yeah, it, they are not completely random cells. But if we evaluate on these 208 cell pairs, we can then see that the mean discrepancy between left and right if we just assign by overlap is 2.8 genes per pair. And if we assign through this coherent regions, it's actually two genes per pair. Remember that we only, like you have to take this number with a grain of salt, right? We, remember we only have 205 genes. They are not equally distributed through the volume, right? So it's not like we have single cell data where we would say, well, 20,000 genes and we now have a difference of two, no. So on average, they have, let's say, 10 tens of genes expressed. Still, I think that it's a nice improvement and I trust these assignments much more just because I know that they bring out the profiles that, of the genes that should be together. Okay, so this was the major second part. And now we are going into the cell type prediction because well, we already have, we have the cells, right? We have an idea of what they do from the expression profiles. So we can now try to uh, look at the what the cells do from the other side and try to predict the cell type from the segmented morphology. And this is also what Valentina is doing. And so here, and you can see that in those segmented cells, they are clearly different, right? And we know they do different things. However, just like with the gene expression, we don't have labels. Right? And I guess we could coerce the biologists into sitting down and actually labeling the cells they can recognize and some we would recognize ourselves, but still we would never have labels as you would have on the pixel level, right? So we started thinking about the different kind of unsupervised approaches. 
right? And here, yeah, so our goal in this was to learn the representation of a cell, right? Just from morphology, where when I say morphology, I just, I don't mean just shape, but also ultrastructure, but only that, right? So only what we see in the image, not, not gene expression. Right? So learn the representation from EM, such that cells of the same cell type are close in some kind of a representation space. And we want to learn it implicitly with the neural network. So why implicitly? Well, because it has already been done explicitly. And um, yeah, so Kimberly in Yannick's lab has actually extracted a lot of very nice features from like morphology related features from the segmented cells and done the analysis. So we wanted to see if it could be improved by not having the features explicit by actually just learning them. All right, so yeah, we don't have annotations, so we have to do something self-supervised. So here we went with the of the most direct approach, uh, which is yeah, to have a contrastive loss. And then we, we have a cell, right? And then we say this cell is, should be close to the representation of the same cell, but turned around or a bit adjusted and should be further from another cell, right? So this is a contrastive triplet loss training, right? So in the first attempt, we decided to even not go for ultrastructure, but just have the mask. So we have the mask for the cell, we have the mask for the nucleus. Right, and then you can actually see what we are optimizing for. Right, so in the training, we say that these two should be closer together than these two. Right, and this is then we train a neural network to do this. And then we extract the middle layer out of this. And we say, OK, by learning to bring the cyan ones together and push the pink one apart, it has learned so much about the morphology of the cells that we can repurpose this representation to predict the cell type. Okay, so one of the first problems that you meet is that they have a very big size variability. Right? So, yeah, and we also have to fit in the GPU RAM. Right? So we have as just the first try and kind of the most straightforward brute force thing that we could do, we just define the center of the cell as the center of the nucleus. Right? And then we take a box around it and we kind of cut off the rest. Right? Just to see if that would work already. There are better methods to do this, but we just wanted to see what would work. Okay. The second problem is how do you actually validate this? Because like I said, there is no ground truth and they can't really be. So the way we wanted to validate there is to, well, we can just explore the closest cells, right? So if we take a cell and we know it's a neuron and we say, okay, in this new space of representation, which would be the ones that are the closest to it? And you can see that these are indeed the neurons, right? So it's not so bad, but there are also a lot of non-neuron cells. Then we, yeah, we can take a cell which is epithelial and ask which ones are close to it. And you see that, yeah, indeed, epithelial cells are good, but there are also muscles mixed in. So this is kind of a qualitative way to evaluate, right? Um, yeah, so we have seen that this one, it's like it's starting to understand something, but not, not fully. So when we look at what exactly it has learned, we see that we have one feature that basically explains most of the variance, and it's strongly correlated to shape and basically to sphericity. So we saw that, okay, that's going somewhere, but we want to go further. We want to evaluate more precisely. So then Valentina, as usually, because she's so brave, she actually sat down and did some more manual labels, defined seven classes of uh, cell types, right? 16 cells in each. And then, yeah, you can see the examples down there. Again, I have to say that these are the most obvious class representatives that we as non-biologists can recognize in the volume, right? So you, if you have cells which are not so obvious, that's a different thing. Okay, so now if we compare the classification by training a logistic regression on the eight cells and predicting on other eight, yes, I know eight is not much, but we'll get to more. And we compare this learned representation to the explicit representation that we had in the preprint, right? So where the explicit one is the texture descriptors, shape features, intensity histograms, a lot of other things that people could think of. We see that it's already a bit better, right? So on this little test set, we already have the, for the learned features, the accuracy is 65%, explicit is 56. Remember that this is seven classes, right? So 65% is not bad and 56 is also not too bad. Can we do better? Yeah, so what else can we learn? Then we thought of, okay, we can do an autoencoder. Right? You can have a masked 3D volume in, right? It goes through the model, right? It reconstructs the cell, right? You take the bottleneck as your embedding. Right, so yeah, we first were a bit discouraged out of that because the reconstructions are actually quite bad. Right? But then when you think about it, we don't need those reconstructions, right? What we need are the predictions that we can build on top of the representation that they generate. And these are actually quite good, right? So if we just take them at face value, we get 
right? So if we train an autoencoder, take the features that, which were encoded by it, and then use them in this logistic regression setting, we get 86% accuracy, which we thought was actually quite cool. And it also pointed out the big limitation of our approach, which is, well, maybe you should not actually crop cells because the biggest thing that is very confusing in there is the muscles. And in the muscles, you actually, in this cropping that we were doing, you cut off the most characteristic part, right, which is where all this myosin stuff is. So yeah, maybe it's not the best idea, but anyway, if you remove the muscle class, we are actually at 95% accuracy, which is something I haven't thought we could be at. If you want to look at some of the remaining errors, it sometimes confuses secretory versus ciliated cells, which do look, to my eye at least, fairly similar. Okay, going on, if we now, so that is a tiny, tiny little, but quantitative data set. If we now look qualitatively, like we were doing before, you can now see that for epithelial, it's really nicely predicting on the surface like it should, right? So this is the high probability of the epithelial cells. What we are especially proud of is that you see like in here, which is around this mouth cavity, it's also all epithelial. We have not had any cells like that in the training or in this little quantitative test, but it still picks them up very nicely. Yeah, for neurons, it also really picks up neurons. And for gut, the gut is all in the gut. And well, yes, sometimes in the muscle, but yeah, remember I said that for muscle, our representation is not the best. Right? You have the ciliated where the ciliated should be. So it's, um, yeah, going well. So we have the segmentation, right? We have the gene expression. We have this uh, cell type prediction, at least in its very early form. How do we put it all together? Because that is all like very nice derived data and a lot of images on our hard drives, but this is not what the biologists want to see. And the stuff that biologists want to see is what Christian is working on. And that is actually bringing all this data together into what we call the, the Platy browser, which is an instance of the big browser, which he calls Mobi, which stands for Multimodal Big Image Data Sharing and Exploration. That's a Fiji plugin. That's what it looks like. It actually looks much better live, but I hope he will show it to you himself in some kind of future talk. Um, why is it so awesome? Well, you can have Fiji on your own laptop. You have S3 object stores somewhere, right, in facility, or if, you know, in our case, we just have it shared, so you can go and look at our platy, explore it yourself, if you install the plugin. That is where all the image data is. On top of that, you can have all the tabular data. In our case, for example, the cell type predictions or the features, right? So like here, you could have, for example, sphericity and you can color them all by sphericity. So you can have the image data that we provide, tabular data, either that we provide or that you have composed yourself because you have your own features you want to analyze. And then you have it there and you can explore the whole volume. You can explore every segmented thing as a 3D shape together with all the neighbors. You can color by any kind of feature. You can export all of this and then do numerical analysis on top. It's a great tool. I really encourage you to check it out if you want to build an atlas and then give it over to biologists to actually explore the data. Getting to the end. Uh, so the first two parts that I talk about, the segmentation and the expression assignment are in this preprint. The cell type work is not published and not finished, uh, but yeah, I think it's still fairly interesting. So I wanted you to hear about it. The, all the segmentation tools are available in Constantine's GitHub. The Platy browser or the Mobi, the bigger thing that includes it, is uh, in its own GitHub repo. And you can also find it in the update site. So you can install the plugin and then enjoy all the Platinaris uh, ultra structure and anatomy you ever wanted to. In the end, yeah, I just want to thank my great group and especially Constantine and Valentina who have done an amazing job there putting this project together. And yeah, thank you for coming and listening to that. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, uh, Anna, Christian, do you want to uh, take over the Q&A? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I, we can. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can hear good. you. Perfect. Good. So, are there questions? <laughs> Just speak, maybe. Um. Yeah, so, if no one's asking a question, I, I can maybe uh, kind of uh, kick things off. So, uh, so you were starting at the beginning, uh, uh, like talking about the, also the segmentation, and there's a fundament. Uh, you were actually using the uh, the nuclei, right? So, but I actually saw when you were talking about the difficulty between um, segmenting different cell types. Um, that one difficulty was uh, segmenting the muscle cells also because yeah. they are super dense. And honestly, I have to say, when I looked at the images, I had a hard time to make out where the nuclear is <laughs> because it's just like super crowded. Everything's like very, very dark. And uh, 
So, uh, and, and also later on when you kind of um, explained how nicely everything was separated, um, the examples which you show never really included the muscle cells. <laughs> muscle cells. <laughs> so can you maybe uh, um, say uh, how uh, accurate uh, this was with um, these type of cells? I think later on it worked quite nicely with the overviews which you showed uh, in, the, in the final step. Oh, we have a zoom in view for the muscles. Wait, I can get back there since I'm still sharing somewhere. Uh, before, um, yeah. So these are the muscles. Ah, okay. So it's really super fine everything. So yeah, I think the the muscles are actually for segmentation. The muscles are very nice. And so once it figured out, the I think the big problem was really the borders of the muscles to something else, and right? because the boundaries between the muscles themselves they are clear, right? It's dark, right? But it's still different because I think the just the direction of these myofibers, whatever they're called, right? So you see they're kind of orthogonal, right? So it is all texture there. And then I think the separator is still fairly clear. But yeah, but the problem that we had with the muscles is just, yeah, they are very big. And then eventually, if it would not recognize the boundary to the other tissue, it would just leak out of there and create a big mess. But once we could stop this leaking to other tissues, I think inside the muscle tissue, then it figured out how to break them up. I know, thank you. So, so then uh, maybe the second question uh, for the um, gene expression uh, section. There it was so so the, so the two data sets which you're losing, like microscopy and EM, and so they were taken completely separately on different yes. types of samples, right? That's why it's so hard to bring them together. And I actually like the trick of uh, using um, uh, the bilateral symmetry, but um, if you don't have such a nice sample, <laughs> such a, um, how can I say, um, like symmetric sample uh, around. So how would you go about, do you have any kind of plans for other types of organisms where such a symmetry is not necessarily given? I think right now it's an incredible nice uh, trick which you applied in order to, uh, to do the uh, assignment of the uh, gene expression. But um, going forward with different organisms, uh, can you maybe um, make a guess of what would be the best strategy to do this? Oh, I think a lot of things are actually bilaterally symmetric, right? So a lot of ah, biologically okay. interesting animals are bilaterally symmetric. But if you look at the ones that are not, so I think there the key would then really be to find the, and here, like you correctly said, the data sets were acquired completely separately and not um, like the gene expression acquisition was done with the biological question in mind, right? And not with the atlas building in mind, right? So I think there, if someone wanted to start from scratch for a different animal, I would say that you have to image the genes that are only found in some kind of morphologically characteristic cells so that you could use them as sort of your sanity check, right? So if you have myosin expressed in muscles, Right, then you can check that it's that actually overlaps and that it's only expressed there. But then you also need it to be expressed in the cell types that you can easily find from morphology. Right, so you can have, have to kind of think of an anchor that would connect the gene expression to what you can see without gene expression and then use that for validation. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. There are other questions. Maybe you can just switch on your video and wave and then I... Okay, Martin. Hey Anna, so um, hey. you're at the at the far end of the workflow, and I was wondering, since this is on my desk, um, alignment is is very crucial for the connectomics data. Um, so so how perfect do you need the alignment to be? And because I know that this this volume is not perfectly aligned um, to do these kind of uh, segmentations nicely. How perfect? Well, I think there you... it's not. It's not the alignment that is the problem. I think there it's just that in some of the neuroptile areas, the membranes are just destroyed. Right? So it's, um, yeah, it's like, you know, it looks like there was a blender in there and then you just never really know where exactly it goes. And I guess as a human who has a really preconceived idea of how you should trace the fibers, that would be good enough. But for a machine, it just isn't. I mean, I would never trust these results. Like human tracings, yes, but uh, automatic here, no. So I think here for, and the alignment we can't really complain about. I think that's uh, that's all good. Yeah, I think as long as the membranes are very well preserved on the sample prep side, we can work with alignment like this. If you can make it better, cool. But if not, we can manage like that. 
Okay, someone else? Gee, a lot of familiar faces, but they're all you know, hiding in there. They're all shy. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, anyways, so hi Janelia guys, it's very nice to <laughs> see you at least like this. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the talk. It's nice to see you all. Um, and it's nice to see this work presented. Um, I, I guess I have two related questions on the last thing that you presented, which has to do with the um, predicting the cell types from the morphology. And so is it, is it right that you're not, it, that is the network sees only the mask and not the underlying image data? No, that was, that was the two okay. different things that I showed, right? At 65%, Great. it has only seen the mask. Right at Great. 95, okay. it already sees the underlying image data. Okay, perfect, perfect. So that, that does help. And yeah. then the second question is how, um, I guess, what is the resolution of the mask and image data that it sees to make this prediction? Is it full resolution or is, it da is that also downscaled somewhat? I think it's full. So okay. I, I'm not 100% sure, but if it's downscaled, then not more than by two. Okay, wow. Because we, we really wanted to look at the, you know, the subtle texture changes which yeah. actually made them all different. Yeah, that, that, that makes complete sense. I, I was asking because I was curious if, uh, like the extent to which um, the, the, the context that you would get from downsampling would, okay, Valentina is Oh, but we don't show times. other cells, right? We always mask yeah. it out. Right? Yeah, that's true, that's true. I see. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, then Mark, maybe, if you want to ask. Uh, sure. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, with regard to multinucleate cells, then, um, would how close would you be able to um, identify and distinguish those with what you currently have, um, and would that be kind of already clear um, now that you're able to kind of pull this out um, from what you have at the moment? So I think, yeah, we we try to to consider the multinucleated cells, but. I don't think anyone really knows if they have multinucleated cells at this stage, right? And um, so we just assumed that probably not. And uh, from what we have seen, like, yeah, maybe we have cut a bit too much, but the good effects that we see from really making every cell contain one nucleus really far outweigh the possible bias against the multinucleated cells. So I think there, if someone comes with a data set that really has multinucleated cells and we know about them, we would probably think of maybe classifying the nuclei first then, right? because I would suppose there is a certain morphological difference between them and then just not putting the edges between the ones that are likely uh, belonging to the cell type, which has multiple nuclei. Okay, thanks. Can I ask a quick question? Um, oh, hey, man. Uh, hey, how's it going? Good, <laughs> you good. You mentioned in passing you. that uh, that uh, Constantine had uh, written some code or figured out a nice way of running. I think it was multi-cut blockwise. Is that right? Um, yeah. Were there was there anything interesting to say there, or were there any uh, big tricks to it, or was it straightforward? And I don't know. Is that an implementation that's uh, easy to use? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I think there it's. I, I'm sure you all know this, right? So after you go above a certain image size, right? Let's say 100 gigs, nothing is really straightforward anymore, right? So anything like a Gaussian filter can kill you, right? So it's um, it's not like it's completely, totally, totally straightforward, but it's not, I mean, other people have used it, let's put it this way. And uh, we also plan to, well, before COVID, we had a big plan that this year we will really put in a lot of time to making this very, very, very accessible. So that has changed the plans a little bit, but we are coming back to it now. So I hope that it will get even better. But I think the foundation is anyway what he has started building when he was still in Janilia, so you're probably even familiar with it. And uh, yeah, on top, I mean, he tried to make it as generalizable as possible. And I mean, it's all openly available and he's also very available for questions if you seriously want to look into that. It's even documented. More questions? So if not, I guess, uh, Cushion, you can otherwise. 
Yeah. End so, the session. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And then um, thanks, Anna. And then see you all in a month, I guess. <clears throat> okay. Ciao. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Yeah.